Be whole and happy Wednesday. We're right there at the crux of the, of the week, the, the, the climax. So I hope everybody's in a safe community uh, and you're doing well. And although this is a different environment, it, it brings my heart nothing but complete joy. I've been, I feel like I've been waiting for this week all year since we last left each other when we were in Louisville. Uh, so I, I want to make sure I uh, maximize the time today. And as I shared with Justin, uh, this is community talk. Uh, so feel free to, to have questions or if you have things that you can contribute to the conversation, uh, definitely voice those out, share those so uh, Justin can share those out. I'm not really pressed to get through the presentation and completion. Uh, it's, it's a little bit different, so I'll go ahead and preface that. Uh, three eyes I'm looking to do today is I'm looking to inform, I'm looking to instruct, I'm also looking to inspire. I really want us to think about how we are holistically cultivating, as the title presumes, cultivating uh, DEI work into the fold of what we do and also us as human as as humans in the world. All right, so let's get started. So of course, what's uh what's the presentation about learning outcomes? Uh, so our community learning outcomes, and this is something I want us to both, we engage in this together. We, 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 we stand in agreement uh, that CO delegates would be shared strategies to employ when unpacking bias, privilege, and prejudice. Uh, we will also discuss strategies for fostering a mindset of uh, mindset and culture of inclusivity. Uh, we will also discuss strategies for anti-racism and allyship, allyship for, by non-Black allies. Uh, we will also share recommendations for campus to an act regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And lastly, I will share uh, my diversity Dr. Seeds model of DEI, Seeds DEI model for individual to campus practice and implementation. So let's get to work. Okay. So I got to let you know who I am because this allows you to know what, what, what lenses I'm looking in, at through life. Right? So these are some of my salient ID identities. First and foremost, I am a black man. I'm a proud black man. I hold it uh, that in every space that I, I, that I absorb, uh, whether it's physical or whether it's, it's, whether it's uh, virtual, like this platform here. Um, I'm also a black father. I'm a partner. I'm a practitioner, student affairs pro. I'm also a doctoral student. Y'all pray for me. Uh, it's been a journey. Uh, so, but the finish line is getting a little bit more clear. Uh, so this, this is where I'm coming from, but I'm hoping the information that I have to share today, everyone can adopt and adapt based on your identities that you share, the intersectionalities of your identities and your, and your personalities. However they may show up, I hope that just able to contribute to those. All right, so this is one of the things that, before I get into it, uh, as a Black man, my most salient, the foundation of my salient identities, uh, this is a, a kind of mantra and meditation uh, that I go through every morning, either on my drive to work or either on my drive home. Sometimes when I'm, uh, I'm just waking up and I kind of try to repeat some of these things to myself because there's been so much uh, that uh, has happened uh, to Black men and around Black men that these, this is an affirmation that I repeat with myself to uh, reaffirm and confirm my, my, my space, right, my, my, my identity. So I am important, and you're more than welcome to, to use this. I'm important. I am strong. I am vulnerable. I am confident. I am love. I deserve love. I am human. I belong. I do value and bring worth to the spaces I hold. Black lives matter. My Black life matters. Black dreams, purposes, and voices matter. My crown is a light sits high and will remain high even when my smile dims and my mind is made to be heaven. I do indeed matter. So that is something, so sometimes when I get to work and colleagues say, oh, he, he, he has an extra energy today. It's probably because I just finished saying this when I stepped out of my car, right? Because I don't know what's waiting for me in the day to unfold. I don't know what's going to happen on campus or I don't know what's going to happen in the world. Uh, but this helps reaffirm that I belong to the communities and the spaces that I hold, but also reaffirms my Black identity. Um, and then we have everything that happened in 2020 and that continues to happen today. I can't, I have to use this platform in order to say that. And that is a part of the DEI work is acknowledging the realities that happen uh, to me as a Black man, also to my Black community. And just in global news uh, uh, period, right? So we have to say their names from Breonna Taylor to George Floyd. So many people, even those who have passed, we lost such 
monumental legends last year that impacted how I showed up at work, that impacted how I was able to show up in other identities as a father and a partner in my home. And I had to carry that. And I have to make sure that is known because I'm bringing that into that space. Those are the spaces often two times is, is we also made to separate those. And sometimes it's not that easy. So we have to make sure we say those names. We went through that and we continue to say those names. We will continue to stretch their legacy into our present day. Simply put, I'm black and I'm exhausted, right? I'm black, I'm exhausted, and I'm black and exhausted. So, but still, I want to be here. I want to observe, absorb this space with you all. I want to hold that. But the reality is, is us the it's more pressing than ever for us. So take a look around, take inventory, look around us and see what is going on with folks, right? Like one of the keynotes uh, Dr. Stephanie Carter said today, it's we're in a pandemic. I feel like that's the end of every statement. Like I'm surviving in a pandemic. I am persisting, I'm showing up at work in a pandemic. I am being a black man in a pandemic. And I want us to make sure we're holding that truth. We're uh, taking the time to unpack for what it really means and how it impacts our work, how it impacts the colleagues around us, how it impacts our family. Because so, right now, especially with these increased Zoom spaces and the way work and home has merged, we they are collective spaces. So there's not, there's not a lot of room for us to say, oh, well, I'm going to be this person over here and then I'll deal with that later, right? So this is where I am, folks. And then let me just say 2020 was too much. It just was. Take it out, put it on the guy on the side of the curve. Let the people get it. I don't want no more. And you know what? 2021 has been showing off too, right? So we need them, we need 2020. Go ahead and get in line. We saw 2020. We had enough. We we need some good news. That's why I'm so happy C Ho is here. I feel like this is my space to exhale, be with my folks, and uh for us to connect and grow together. But 2020, I don't want to see you. I don't ever want to hear from you again. I'm good, right? And 2020 made me feel like that. What more do you want from me from school, from work? When I'm in the ninth meeting of the Zoom day, what more do you want from me? I can't, I don't have another Zoom room in me, right? So we have to make sure, again, as we're doing this work, as we're doing diversity, equity, inclusion, as we're investing that energy, we have to make sure that we're asking, taking an active assessment of ourselves and realizing what is actually going on. And really, and finally, before I get into the meat of the presentation, we have to affirm and confirm that it's okay not to be okay. We're in an age and we're in a profession who has a history of we are we uh, applaud perfection. We applaud when folks have too much on their plate and they're able to get things done. We applaud sometimes. We have applauded in the past when you put yourself last. No, no more of that. We have to rearrange our priorities and we must do it uh, accurately and we must do it promptly. But it is okay to be okay. There's many days I've showed up to work and I've had colleagues really surround me and say, hey y'all, I just gotta be honest, today is not it. I don't have it. I have the, I have the least to give and I need to be in my space and I will be in my bucket. I'm still gonna contribute as much as I can. And they're able to hold me in community. And we're able to step in the gap for one another. We have to do that even more when it comes to DEI work. All right, I need y'all to entertain me just for a second. All right, it's cold outside. Virginia, we just got some snow. I, I'm not with it. I haven't been around snow in a while. So, you know, yeah, they can have that. So one of my favorite, most favorite seasons is fall, y'all. It's fall. So right now, I need us to go to our most favorite fall memory. I want to hold it. I want to stay there. And just because fall, break, it brings football. I'm an SEC baby. So I, I've been at a couple of institutions, got that, caught that SEC favor. It's football. It's tailgates. It's it's just that, it's something about being on the campus when it, the sun just going down. It's a crisp cool in the air. It's, it's just a beautiful time of year. So that's what I want to kind of focus and frame this conversation on today is about fall. When fall comes, I also think about harvest. I also think about what are we planting to yield the fruit that is to come? What are we putting in the ground? What are we sowing? What is it that we're looking to reap? And so I've had to take this attitude when it comes to harvest when my DEI work, my diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice, when I when I engage the work of racism and dismantle, to dismantle and destruct, I have to say, well, what am I trying to harvest? When I'm approaching the work, what am I trying to gain back? What am I trying to put in the atmosphere? What, I'm, what am I trying to decree and declare to, 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 to really come into reality? Right? What new realities am I trying to paint? 
So when you talk about harvest, right? I want you to think about harvest. You you think about farming. You think about uh, uh, the the planting seeds in the ground, things coming to fruition. Uh, and you want to think. I want you to think about just the hard work, right? I, I did some reach or research on farming, and I realized that uh, in 2019 there was an estimated 2.5 million farms in the United States. In fact, that number has steadily decreased since 2007, when there was an estimated 2.2 million. The U.S. agriculture and food industry is a huge billion-dollar business. Some individual farms hold an annual network of uh, and yield of over $300,000. Now, when I read that, I said, maybe I should have changed my career path. You know, it might not be too late for me. But when I, th when I thought about the, the harvest and the work that they do is... Uh, we want to continue to reflect and share with others in dialogue after this space is shared today about what it means to harvest and what it means to harvest and, and what are we planting when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, I share with you that a harvest time typically happens during autumn time and further reflection, I realized the period before the harvest is the most important. It's the actual gathering of planted crops. The period of time uh, Cult where cultivation happened is actually the longest part. It's the actually the longest period where the most work is put in. And I, ha I stand here today to ask, what work are we willing to put in when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion? The harvest season, uh, when it talks about cultivation, it usually involves preparing and use to develop. It means to take steps to grow something or improve its growth. This is what we have done and must commit to do even great with greater intentionality, with greater attention, and with greater resources to integrate into all aspects of our personal and professional spaces. We must integrate DEI into the core of our campus cultures, campus policies, campus protocols, campus curriculum, all components. Nothing should be untouched when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So yes, we have a lot of work before us, but it is not optional. It is definitely mandatory. So when it comes to cultivation, one of my thoughts is that we must cultivate the heartbeat and soul as well as motivate the hands and feet of higher education to properly prioritize, operationalize, and holistically exercise the work and wellness of diversity, equity, and inclusion. A mentor once told me, if you want to see what's important to an institution or to a person, check their calendar and check their checkbook, right? Where are they spending their time? Where are they spending their money? Are we investing the time and resources to truly cultivate diversity, equity, inclusion into every aspect of what we're doing? It is not optional. If anything COVID-19 has taught us is that practices that we've done are not the, the practices, the structure of higher education. It, it may not be as sustainable, right? It may not be as effective as we thought was, right? We may have taken it for granted. I know for one, when it comes to COVID-19, I felt like I got, I was a professional and I got caught looking with my head down. Um, I was caught off guard by COVID-19. And this made us rethink, redesign, and, and, and do student affairs differently. So, but we cannot leave DEI out of that equation. We have to do it on purpose, with purpose, with each and every day and decision that we make. So here's some things, and here's the meat of what I want to share with you today. And again, feel free to shoot questions, feel free to share strategies that you employ at your institution or that you do personally. Uh, I want to talk about a little bit about multicultural competent supervision. You have to know who you are supervising, right? And let me say that again, you have to know who you are supervising. We cannot continue to manage people like we manage processes. They are two are not interchangeable. We have to make sure that we are taking an accurate inventory to find out the ethnicities, to find out the intersectionality, to find out what are people like, so what are their experiences. Uh, and as much as they want to share, because some people will want to share a lot, some people will not want to share uh, that much. Some people say, hey, I just really want to come, come to my office. I want to connect with some students, do a couple of programs, not get Zoom fatigue, and I want to go home and, and, and come back the next day, right? But we have to make sure, because one of the faults that I, that I will unknowingly admit and, and that I've grown from, I used to supervise from the, the lens that, oh, you're supposed to treat everybody the same. That is incorrect, right? 
you need to take inventory and assessment because everybody does not need. I had the opportunity to, to uh, a few nights ago to talk to Dr. Craig Wilder, uh, who is the author of Ebony and Ivy, uh, is one of his books. And one of the things he talked about is uh, we need to seek fairness over equity. Um, and the reason he said that is because equity, some uh, equality, I'm sorry, equity, uh, fairness over equality. He said fairness, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, equality uh, gives the assumption that we all started from the same position and that all of our history is parallel and that is similar. And he's like, that's not the truth. So we need to seek fairness. And when it comes to fairness of supervision, you have to take inventory of the people that you are supervising, the people that you have been entrusted with by your institution, by your department to develop, you have to make sure you're understanding like, as a black man, I may learn completely different than a white male or a white female. One of the things I, I learned at my previous institution uh, was I came into my third, my second year there and I looked around and out of a staff of five, I had four uh, staff members that identified as white. Now, the work that came into is I had to pause the tape and say, you know what, this is the first time in my life I've had a majority white staff. What does that look like? So I had an intentional conversation once we had the transfer uh, of supervision areas with these individuals and say, you know what, I'm going to be honest with you. What does it mean to manage you as a white staff member? What does that look like? What support is support? What is advocacy? What does challenge look like? And we had some very intentional conversation um, that helped, I think, both the staff member and myself grow uh, from those conversations and say, you know what? We're both invested in what this pro uh, professional de development is because professional development of a staff member is a partnership. It takes two, right? And you need to be intentional with that investment. So I need to know when something that's going on culturally that's affecting my staff member, even if it's happening at a global level, I need to say, you know what, I need to check in. You know what, I'm not, I don't need that report till Friday. I know such and such happened Tuesday morning. Let me check in with Tom today because I, I think Tom is from Idaho and, and something happened in Idaho and I need to check in on Tom. It may affect his family. So I need to make sure, we need to make sure we're doing that. We need to do that in intention. On to the next one, three R's, right? I want to talk about recruitment, retention, and recognition. This is a three R model that I was able to employ at, at previous institutions that we have to make sure that we also incorporate in DI into those practices. And it takes intentionality. And when it comes to recruitment, how are you, how, how, how when's the last time you looked at your hiring practices? When's the last time you said, you know what, do, does your search committee that, that screens applicants, that interviews applicants, do they go through a bias training? I don't hear nobody. Okay. So do they talk about their bias in the open? Do they have training on what it means to actually interview somebody and how to check your bias at the door? We have to have these conversations and we have to have them and they need to be built into the process and not a, oh, well, let's just talk about it for 30 minutes and keep it moving. It needs to be staged throughout your recruitment process to have check-ins, to have bias check-in. And a bias is always not entirely negative. It could be, hey, I actually worked with this person uh, uh, several years back, and I, but I still think I'm in a position to effectively evaluate. Let's have that in conversation so everybody at the search team table understands that's, that's, the, that's where I'm coming from. Implement these trainings. Calling your HR representative, calling experts that are uh, that are knowledgeable and, and can be a resource on how, what it means to have a bias-free uh, recruitment process. And when it comes to recognition, we all do not appreciate. We do. We all do not want to be appreciated in the same manner. How are you surveying that? You may. One of the things I learned uh, uh, in a previous role was. When someone leaves the department, when somebody transitions to a position, oh, you know, we're happy for Justin. He got, you know, he got that vice chancellor position. I'm speaking to the distance for you, Justin. So we 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 excited, we're celebrating, and then we go ahead and schedule something. We schedule, you know, we call in the pizza party, pizza parade. We we get everything. We get folks from all across campus. And guess what? Justin wanted none of it because Justin is an introvert, which is a good thing. Justin wanted to, hey, I just need to make sure this less check hit my account and I want to sail off into the sunset. And we need to honor that. So having, 
have a conversation, right? Make that transition a partnership and say, how do you wish to, to, to be celebrated? How do you wish to be pressed to, to be appreciated? We need to make this an active practice in the work that we do. And that is how we cultivate diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have to do it on purpose. Because one, what I came to realize is the foundation of me throwing that going away party for that staff member, the core of it wasn't about them. It was about me feeling like I was doing due justice. But I really needed them to understand we, are, we want to honor you and how you want to be honored, and we just need to facilitate it. And then when it comes into retention, how are you having, how, how do you feel, your staff feel about your department? You need to have a temperature check. Do you have town halls? Do you have staff meetings or, or, or open spaces where we, they can just give feedback? Um, Sometimes it may not, because of power dynamics alone, a staff member may not feel that it's comfortable or convenient to share direct feedback about a departmental process or, or personnel in a particular one-on-one -on -one space with the super person that supervisor. We need to create additional spaces or additional mechanisms. Can we have anonymous forms so we can be able to have that feedback and grow for it. Yes, it's, it may not feel good, right? But we will feel better when we get to the other side of that feedback and say, you know what? We actually had seven out of 12 staff members have this concern. We need to do something about it. And we don't need to call anyone about it and say, well, I heard what y'all said. We need to do that. No, just address the feedback, fix the issue and move forward, right? And also that is also what needs to happen in closing the loop of assessment. You need to report back, say, we heard you. This is what we're planning to do going forward. One of the things I can appreciate about being at VCU is we had a town hall meeting when they shared that uh, the state of Virginia is holding various institutions accountable about uh, white supremacy structures and, and, and uh, things of that nature on the campus and in curriculum. And the committee that was put forth has publicized a website to identify what they're doing and provided a timeline on which they are allotted to get it done uh, and providing consistent updates to the campus and the community. That is the type of transparency that this DEI work calls for. We need to implement that into our res life processes with our students, with our staff, and most, most certainly with us with, with ourselves. We need to make sure that that is what is that what we that is what we're committing to. And then when it's personal and professional development, if the only I would say for me, I'll take a step back. For me, DI work is personal as a black man. It's, it's personal work. It's work that I own because I want to. Uh, but it's also professional development. I don't push agendas on anyone, and we have to make sure we're conscious that we're not doing that, uh, whether it's in, in my positionality. Sometimes I remove myself from spaces. If, if I look around and I say, oh, you know, there's 90% hall directors here. I think I might need to withdraw myself from this space. So my positionality does not serve as a barrier to this communication, to what's shared. But when it comes to personal development, you have to invest some time in this DEI work for you, right? It doesn't have to benefit anybody at work. It doesn't have to make you a know-it-all and say, you know, I'm going to go tell them people at work about what I learned. Sure, if, if the opportunity presents itself or you create a space to share out, that's fine, right? But what are you doing to invest in you when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion? One of the things that I've tried to practice over uh, the past five years is I find a person that I've probably disagreed with maybe once or twice, and I try to invite them to lunch. I work up the courage to invite them to lunch, right? So we can have space. Now, we, we safe distance, so I might have to have lunch over Zoom at this point. But I, I because I want to not, I'm trying to stop myself from forming a bias against difference. I want to further understand why that person's perspective about a particular situation. I want them to further understand me. I want to learn some more about them as a, as a person, right? So what are we doing to invest in ourselves when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion? And another thing, as a black male, sometimes the days are so heavy, as I told you before, I've come to work or I've been in certain spaces to say, I don't have it. I can't show up. I, I, I don't have anything to give or contribute besides my presence. Right. And I had to work and practice at owning that and being able to say that um, and to and, and to be OK with that. And then professional development. What's the last thing you read? Right. What's the 
how are you utilizing your staff meetings to pull something from inside higher ed or pull something, one of these professional development sessions that will be posted in CEHO? How will you utilize this information for people who couldn't make it today? How will you utilize this information to restructure and challenge yourself? Okay, what kind of supervisor am I? What kind of leader am I? How will you allow this to impact your decision making on a daily basis? I try to interrupt, I try to allow the reality of DUI, DEI to interrupt my decision making as much as possible throughout the day. I, I want to make that decision, but you know what? I'm about to make a decision about somebody that's not in this room. I need to do some more inventory before I need to reach out, right? Also, look around, take inventory, look around. Who's not at the table? And I'm also a proponent of, I'm an accomplice of, if it's not enough room at the table, remove the damn table. Turn the table into more chairs. Honestly, why do we have a table? Why? So let's, and, and I know that's theoretical, but let's work to remove the table. Let's remove table from spaces. In certain spaces, the positionality trumps so much, can trump knowledge of anyone in the room. And we need to make sure we're checking that. There have been many times where I've had, I've been in a room and I recognize my privilege and my positionality as a male. And I have to step back and say, you know what? I could say something, but that black woman over there just said it and I don't need to echo her and then I'm, I get the praise. So we need to check that. We need to hear folks. We listen, but are we actually hearing them and what they're saying and watch? Well, this didn't happen because it didn't come out of this person's mouth. We need to stop that. We are stunting the growth of our profession. We need to make sure that is not committing to DEI. We can make anti-racist statements. We can make sure uh, that we're wearing a t-shirt and that we're, you know, Black Lives Matter. Do they, right? If Black Lives can matter to you on the internet, but don't matter to you at your workplace, then they don't matter. The, the, the two are not congruent, they don't equal. And we have to make sure we're owning that, right? So, and then grace and space. Give yourself grace and space through this work. It's exhausting, it can get tiring. It, it, if you are jogging and smiling through DI work, I need you to take some inventory. Some things are gonna feel good, we're gonna have some wins, but the brunt of this work is exhausting, it's tiring. It makes you think and complex. Uh, sometimes people will catch me looking, looking off into the distance is because I'm looking for better. I'm looking for a better higher ed. And I'm asking myself, what do I do to contribute to get us there, right? To get us to a, a, a better higher ed. So give yourself grace and space. And when you practice grace with yourself, you're that much more able to give grace to somebody else, right? You know, sometimes I go through the drive through to get something and I, I feel the energy and the attitude of somebody of, of the person taking my order is ugly. And I can respond with the same energy, but over time I've learned to respond and not react. And I give that person grace because you know what? They may be on working a double shift because somebody just called in and now they can't go home when they thought to. You know what? I'm going to give grace, right? Because somebody gave grace to me when I didn't know it or, or when I didn't deserve it. And then looking at your practice that's in protocol. If you haven't assessed your practices, I mean, every practice that you do for recruitment, uh, student staff and professional staff, um, to how you do uh, assignments and, and selection for students that live on campus, it's time to, to put those policies on the table and take a fine tooth and comb to them. Have multiple people, external partners, internal partners, internal partners, look at those policies to determine, are they still effective? Are they problematic? If your policies still say he, he and she, you need to look back at your policies. There's some update in terminology and inclusive language that we need to do. And those are the things, right? Sometimes the DEI work is in the details. That's what we need to do. We need to get in the weeds. Again, as, as farmers do, we get in the weeds, we cultivate. This is what we need to do to cultivate DEI. It's those small things that will help impact larger scale platforms and larger scale decisions. So DEI work, what we need to get away from, DEI work is not a daily check by, it's a lifetime commitment. I can't come into my office and say, you know what? I'm diverse, I'm, I'm about 20% more diverse than I was yesterday, I'm good. No, I gotta keep working in it, I gotta keep reflecting. I dropped the ball today, how am I gonna correct it? I, I, I need to grow in this particular area of, of, of DEI work. What am I doing to pursue 
that betterment, right? And we need to make sure we're doing that, particularly as students, particularly as professionals, particularly as leaders. This is how we're going to better our field. And we all share that responsibility. It does not fall on the shoulders of one or two people. It's on all of us. And we have to make sure we're doing our part. You have to dig deep. When I thought about cultivation and farmers, you have to dig deep. One of the part of <clears throat> most important part of cultivation when it comes to farming is removing weeds, right? When you remove weeds, you get in there and you remove weeds. And they said the most effective process is to do it with your hands. And that kind of hit me in a very profound way is because that is what takes DEI work. You have to do it with your hands. You have to, you're going to have to fail at it but you gotta try in order to fail and you have to fail in order to get better. So how are you doing this? Ask yourself every single day. And there are times you're gonna have to say, you know what, it's all too much, I need to take a time out, right? Recharge yourself, take care of yourself, prioritize yourself first as well. But you need to make sure, ask yourself, how am I committed to the work? Because there are certain days that I've come into the office or I've been at home uh, and I say, you know what, I've been off my game. I've been, I haven't been as committed. I've, I've used my privilege to opt out some situations and some, in some spaces because it's more comfortable for me, even though it wasn't convenient or beneficial to the people who were affected, right? I could turn the TV off, but I, but then I would miss what's going on in Texas, right? I can, I can miss some things that I, some philanthropy that I could be connected to, to help because that type of situation can happen to anybody. Right. And there are other things that are happening in the world that I'm paying attention to, because like I said, when it comes to supervision, when it comes to just being a colleague, I, I want to know as much about the people around me, about my community and take that, in, that inventory, because things in the world are affecting people very differently. Like I said before, COVID didn't just uh, affect us, uh, uh, how we show up and how we do student affairs. It affected our personal lives. It made us merge personal and professional lives in a way that we probably haven't done before. People are coming to work with very serious conditions that they are managing. They are being caretakers. They may have just survived COVID themselves. This is nothing we've seen before, folks. So we have to think different. We have to, know, we have to be vulnerable. We're going to have to continue to humanize each other in this DEI work in a very different but intentional way. We have to dig deep. What is in there? Some of us feel like the bones that are in our closet are just going to evaporate and disintegrate on their own. It's not. You have to open that door, name them, pull them out, go through them, unpack them, and do the work. Stop letting the people you supervise do your work. They can't keep, the reason they're giving you A plus B equals C answers in response to I'm fine, I'm okay, I'm doing fine, in your supervision one-on-ones is have you ever thought that they're not closed, but they may just be closed to you because of your supervision style, that they don't feel like you're an advocate, that they don't feel like they have an ally on you, that you're not committed to your 50% of their, their professional development. You have to take inventory. And there are times we will have to own that, you know what? I failed you. I failed you yesterday, but not today. I own that I didn't do something for you. I own that I missed that meeting. Ah, I forgot. I'm human. I'm, I'm my bad. I got you. Let's let's create some space. Let's talk about the impact of me missing that meeting with you. We have to make sure we're digging deep. And also we want to talk about what's above surface and below surface. I'll give a quick example, and I want to be conscious of time. Uh, there was a there was a bias I had when I was at a particular uh, university before, and it developed because I was getting student conduct. And out of like the first 15 cases I had, 11 cases has students involved from a particular from one particular fraternity. What I did not do was catch myself until after the fact, I caught myself one day reading a case and I saw that this person was again in my about to be in, in my office again for a conduct that associated with this fraternity and I said, you know what they did it. That's not an equitable process, folks. I had to catch that. I actually shared that conversation with that staff member because they also shared they had a bias with me from my first interaction. And we had, were able to grow from that. I was able to start supporting them, uh, going to some of their events and, and showing support. I was able to show them who I was outside and inside of the office. We have to address those bias. You have to name them. What's below your surface? Again, stop letting other people do your work for you. You have to commit. I need to get better at this. 
and getting better at something takes practice and takes intentionality. So self-work, self-worth is self-work. You have to put the work in. You have to. Just like when I worked my first job and I would clock in and clock in, clock in and clock out every day, I had to put the work in. I had to come to work. Check your attitude before you come into your work. Where is my attitude? There's time I've come into spaces uh, in a recruitment meeting or come into a leadership meeting and say, you know what? Today, y'all, I just had something traumatic happen. So I'm in a space. Let's talk about it. Because I don't want anybody to take that on. Is it me? Did I do something? Did I say something to them? And it only takes that ripple effect of a moment for you not to own your stuff, for you to mess up somebody else's day. For you to send somebody spiraling saying, well, they got an attitude with me. I don't know what I did to them. I, I, I thought we were friends. I thought we were good colleagues. Do your work. And there are times when I do this, I feel so much better when I come to work because I'm able to give a more a fuller version of myself. And then it's, let me say this. It's one thing to be woke. It's another thing to be woke and working. What are you doing? What are you doing? Everybody woke. Everybody want to be woke. We, we have to stop making truths trends. We, it has to be the truth. Are you doing the work? When you're hiring somebody, are you checking your bias? When you're working with a staff member that's different than you, are you checking your bias? When that staff member who will not for the sake of their life turn their monthly reporting in on time, are you checking your bias? Are you building a bias against them? Because now you have decided that these opportunities that are coming from a divisional level, they never get it because you upset with them because they never turn in their monthly report. Now, I believe in holding people accountable, but I have to check my bias too. Because what will happen is I will start to find that star player that I lean on for everything. And I will burden my star player because I want to reward their consistency. I want to reward their loyalty. That's not equitable, folks. That's not inclusive practices. We have to cease those things. We have to call it out and we have to address them to be better. We have to learn from one another. We have to correct ourselves and make sure we're holding ourselves accountable. And then also in DI work, I realized I could not unpack the impact of bias until I unpack my own backpack of bias. What's in your backpack? What's in your backpack? Sometimes I'm, I'm unable to hold some folks accountable because I'm in my own backpack. Is that what the, the young people say today? I'm, I'm dating myself. I'm in my bag. Yeah, and you in your bag and what's in there, right? I've worked with black, young black males to reposition and try to redefine what vulnerability looks like because I was in an era uh, of, of my mid twenties of saying, you know, black men don't cry. Society would say we're supposed to be tough. You know, things happen at work, you get laid off, something, a difficult decision, you get reprimanded at work. Or well, something happens in the world and I don't have that space and grace to, to be vulnerable, right? And I'm working to, 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 re, to redefine that for myself and redefine that collectively for black men. But I had to start with my own backpack. What's in your backpack? Again, you have to dig deep and you have to do the work. And sometimes when you figure out what's in your backpack, you can identify who's in your village and can help you with those pieces. I said help, I didn't say do, right? You can't assign your work to be somebody else's homework. You gotta do your own work. Some things that you do are individual assignments. Some things you do are group processes. But the thing about group processes, you got to still be there. Don't be that person who just going to show up at the end and get credit. Make sure you're checking all your, all your processes. And when it comes to being a person of color, I had to check my inventory of how I was communicating and how I was not communicating, how I needed to be an ally. I think it was Angela Davis who said, it's in this world, that is growing in tension and, and, and being separated from one another, it's not enough to be non-racist. You have to be anti-racist. And how are you doing that? One of the things I'm trying to do is hold institutions accountable. I've seen a barrage of anti-racism statements, but what is the anti-racism action? What are we doing? How are we destructing? How are we calling out prop? policies that are still affecting our students and, and for them not to have a good pro, uh, a journey and experience, which is already difficult in a very complex and challenging COVID era of higher education. 
You have to unpack it, folks. You have to put it on the table. You have to make space and, and do the work. So as I wrap up in the last two slides, when you talk about harvest and DEI, where are you planted and what's your, what are you planting? Those are two questions I want you to think. What are you planting? I've had some people, been around some people that are very positive. There's some go-getters. There's some hustlers, right? They they really want, they're about this DI work. I plant myself around those folks because I want to be among that crowd. I want to learn from them. I want to pull from them. I want to contribute, right? I want to, I want them to make me better. I want them, I want me to make them better in some ways. And then I have to be conscious of what I'm playing. If I wake up with a bad attitude and I don't check myself, I'm dropping them seeds of bad attitude with everybody around me. And that's irresponsible because we are responsible and we're held accountable for folks' energies. We've held accountable for their development. And we just have to make sure we commit to better, commit to doing better. Where are you planted and what are you planting? Are you planting petty? Because sometimes petty can be funny. I get it, right? But some petty, some petty can be destructive and deceitful right? When it comes to you're making a decision, you're picking a staff member from a fellow HD because they forget, they y'all had a, a quarrel two weeks ago that you're taking them for, you're taking a student to be in your uh, RA in your area that doesn't even want to be in your area, but you don't want another HD to get them. We have to check those policies. We have to check that. You know what? I got a, I got a bias and I need, I need to uproot it, right? Dig it, dig deep, pull it from the roots and figure out what it is. Again, think about where you are planted and what are you planting. Again, we're trying to harvest, we're planting, we're cultivating diversity, equity, inclusion work in, in our professions, in our personal lives as well. All right, the seeds of higher education. So S, so we need to sow with intention and with attention. If you have weeds or things that are problematic, it is an imperative for us to address it. It is not an overnight process. Never in doing bias and inclusion work have, have we woke up the next day saying, well, that's over. That's checked off my list. Remember, DEI is not a checkbox. I'm completely healed of my bias. Said no one ever. You have to commit to the work. Continuous. We have to dig in our, our hands in the work. E is for enrich. Enrich our soul and our soil in the soul of higher education by stretching our learning. What have you read? What, what have you researched lately? From researching articles and literature to engaging in dialogue of, other, of one another's truths, stories, and narratives. Listen to them, hear them, believe them the first time. Right now, I'm actively working on understanding how my identity as a Black man has been a barrier and a bridge to Black women. I'm working to resoil what allyship looks like to Black women as a method of preventative allyship and not settle for reactive and performative allyship that may only be convenient silencing and self-serving. If your allyship works best for you, you're probably not doing it right. If your allyship gives you more privilege, you're probably not doing it right. You need to rethink it, right? All right, second E, we need to exercise what we have learned. CO fit, we have, we have those sessions scheduled throughout this week. You need to log in. You need to exercise what we've learned. It also means that sometimes we will exercise out bias and problematic beliefs that can be considered counter-inclusive or what I call inclusivity resistance. Some people just disagree with DEI work because they didn't come up with it or they don't agree with it personally, right? That's, that's inclusivity resistance. We cannot afford that type. Move out of the way. Get yourself out of the way. Pull yourself out of it. It's not always about you, boo. It's not. My mother told me that early. It's not about you. She tells me every day. I think I'm going to have to get her a shirt. It's not about you, boo. It's about me, right? Um, this involves directly naming then and constantly working to call attention to them, to the bias, and eradicate them by practice. Remember, bias, biases do not get better or resolve themselves. You will mess up. And sometimes standing in the discomfort helps you to disarm those bias even more. Sometimes the practice of bias naming and addressing takes dosages of grace and patience within yourself. But it is also about self-accountability. It's about the process and not about perfection. And D is for dig deep and devote. You have to commit time, energy, and space on a consistent manner. Inclusivity is a mindset and a lifestyle. I found that the deeper I dug, 
I found the actual root of the bias to remove the bias and make room for a greater capacity of intentional inclusion. And then S is for sprout. How will we sprout up? What will sprout up in our harvest of higher education when we commit to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion into all of our spaces, into all of our policy, into all of our practice? It's going to take work, folks. We have to commit to it, though. In doing this for diversity, equity, and inclusion, it can become more of a natural process. We can't think about, we have to stop seeding DI work as a secondary passenger in the work that we do. So again, I ask you, where are you planted? What are you planting? What is the crop that you're planting when it comes to DEI work? Is it self-serving? Because that, that, kind of, that kind of harvest is problematic. Is it because it's convenient in a tradition? It's what we've always done, even though it don't work. Even though people have, have said it doesn't work. You know, sometimes I've been a part of processes that say, we just got to prepare for this and, and, and open it because it happens every year. Well, I'm confused. If it happens every year, are we not doing something to prevent it from happening every year? And not everything is preventable, right? But there are a lot of things that we can, right? Are your facilities, do all your facilities have accessible entrances? When's the last time you walked around all your campus facilities and make sure that you don't own, that you don't have a building that only has steps, right? We need to be, and this is going forward as we're building buildings. We have to make sure we're being a more diverse, a equitable, and inclusive. We have to make sure this is not an afterthought. Make sure ramps and other uh, facility mechanisms are included. There's a ton of research out there what, what other campuses are doing, and we need to make sure uh, we're learning from each other. And when I thought about my work as DEI, I had to really come to the question of was it self-serving, right? Or was it serving others? And I would like to say in most of my work, my DEI work has served others. And I came across this quote that said, if service is beneath you, then leadership is beyond you. What are you doing with your leadership? Leadership is not a position. It's an action and it's a platform accountability. If you're not holding yourself accountable, you risk being effective. And I've heard this problematic statement before of you can do anything for two years. And I think I heard it when I was a hall director. Or you can do it, you can go anywhere and be a hall director for two years. You can endure a lot of trauma in two years too that will take you a lifetime to unpack. We got to hold folks accountable. Leadership practices that are, are not inclusive that are, and we plan catch up folks because we didn't start higher education, but a lot of this higher education started from a non-inclusive standpoint. So we have the responsibility of correcting that narrative, of correcting those policies and practices, of holding one another account and growing each other forward. And I have a couple of questions for you to reflect, respond and repeat, and I'll make sure I send these out. Feel free to share your email or contact me directly to get a list of these questions. Ask yourself, how are you developing higher education as, as students, student leaders and professionals? Number two, in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, what is and what will be your harvest reach? Number three, how are you improving the growth of higher education, especially when it comes to DEI work? Number four, where are the barriers on your campus that do not make it accessible or inclusive? How is your institution's commitment to fostering an anti-racism culture being demonstrated beyond the words shared on your website? Number four, what practices, policies, and protocol do we need to rethink in order to yield a more inclusive society? And number five, or six, I lost count, sorry. How do you create and model belongingness? Are you a bridge to others or are you a barrier? You have to make sure you're taking that inventory. Is your positionality, is your attitude, is your bias being a barrier to someone being their most authentic selves? You know, I see this statement in a lot of recruitment colleagues and we talk about it a lot is, they tell people, oh, we support you being your most authentic self. Not when you have non-inclusive practices. I can't bring myself, my whole self to work 
when I feel like I'm not being heard, being seen, or being valued. And the only way you're going to figure out, do your staff, do the people around you feel heard, valued, and seen, is to ask, to get to know, pay attention. Because sometimes the, we don't have the energy and words. I had to have a very tough conversation with a colleague before. Of, it's like, well, I don't understand your connection with George Floyd. So I'm a black man. And you may process, you know, grief differently or connection to your community differently. And we went into this, we had a great dialogue until I started to feel taxed and said, I can't answer any more questions. I'm starting to feel like you're treating me like a black Google. That's what the internet is for. Do some homework, come back and talk to me so we can have some more conversation. But folks, do the inventory, do the work. Realize you have more influence, position, and power than you think. I've had some brilliant, regardless of what, and get other folks involved, right? One of the beautiful things when I was at the University of Florida that I saw happen was in composing a social justice committee, <clears throat> we had everyone on the committee from hall directors, custodians, maintenance, uh, external partners, get folks to the table. Again, get the table out of the way, but be conscious of who you're inviting to that space. We, everybody, we need to all do this work. I had a conversation with a colleague before at another institution that said, well, you know, that diversity stuff, that's, that's rare as life work. Is it? Is it really? Let me pull up my job description and you show me where that's at. Show me. And we had to have some very intentional conversation and we got to know each other, right? That was one of the people I invited to lunch. We had a couple of lunches because I had some stuff I need to understand about them. But we had to get to an understanding that it's all, everybody's got a responsibility. I don't care if you're the executive director, you even have a more greater influence than you may think. You may not have a constant pulse with your staff, but you have your finger on the decision that can really impact those people's lives. How are we thinking about that? How are we thinking about, let's not take for granted, and we're talking about DEI work, but also the person, the, the person in general, let's not take for granted somebody's working from home. They're managing a lot. When's the last time you checked on them? Another thing when that supervision that just came back to me, in your one-on-one, -on -one, if you have a monthly form or one-on-one -on -one with your staff members, if you asking them first what's happening in their community, what's going on with an update, no, no, change it. Ask them about them first. Don't ask them to tell you all the updates in their community or what's going on in their area to update you and then find energy at the end of the meeting to tell you about them because what they tell you about you may trump all the rest of that. You got to be intentional, folks, and learn. We got to learn from each other. There's some, there's some folks on this call and the institutions that are doing some amazing work. I don't know if uh, I think it's at Stanford. Stanford has an anti-racism racism toolkit. Amazing, folks. I've, I've read it like twice, and I'm trying to figure out how do I implement this into my leadership? How do I implement this into my supervision? When I'm talking to colleagues, hey, I'm having this issue. We learn, listen to and to learn from one another. That is all I have. I think I'm left five minutes. I don't know if there's questions, but I thank you so much. I hope everybody was able to walk away with something. Again, I'm more than welcome to share this information out, um, share this presentation. If you choose to produce it, uh, or want to use the information, I'm also available if you would like for me to, to conduct a Zoom training uh, or anything of that nature with your institution or with your campus, or for us just to connect together as colleagues. I miss, I miss you folks, um, and thank you for this space. Marcus, I just want to reiterate uh, the thanks and all of the positive comments that, that came through in the chat during this presentation, um, the resonance and the level of needed from this presentation, I think, really, really came across. So thank you all very much um, for being here. And thank you again to Marcus for your words, your passion, your energy, and using your platform. Um, I did drop the link in the chat, but now we're all thanking DeMarcus again, which is needed. So I dropped the evaluation link again. Um, but I, I will leave this room open for a little bit if you want to stay and ask DeMarcus any questions. Um, but otherwise, enjoy the rest of your CEDO.
Job well done, King. Job well done. I appreciate you. Thank you for coming, brother. Thank you. Um, Demarcus, I have a question very quickly. Yeah. Um, so in this work, how do you, I guess, maintain um, the strength to do it when you feel like you're not getting the buy-in from your department yeah. um, and you feel that the work is constantly on you um, and sometimes the people put in place around you aren't really enthusiastic about doing the work or really want to do the work. And it is kind of like checking a box off for them. So you kind of find yourself yeah. year after year, constantly just kind of just being the only person to do it. Like, how do you stay in that? Cause for me, I kind of feel like I've like plateaued. Yeah. I've been our diversity and inclusion chair for three years now. And I kind of see the same thing happening. Yeah. And even after expressing myself and talking about it, it kind of seems like the same thing is going on. Yep. Um, so now I'm like, well, I don't know if it's working. Like, I don't, I just don't know. So how do you continue yep. in this work? No, it's, uh, a, I want you to know that that is very real. That is a reality that, that a number of people are facing. And I, and I have been through that before. I think one of the things I try to do is I, I equip myself with, with villages, multiple villages that I'm able to share out. Um, and I'm able to share out in words that I probably shouldn't use in public. Um, so, I, so I'm not holding that or harnessing that energy because it can be very taxing. Um, I also schedule days off. And that has been a lot. Like I scheduled, like I have days in October already and I just got to my job. So um, because something's going to happen, right? Life, life never just stops. Something's going to happen that I just need a day to do nothing and just be. Um, so those pop-up days and sometimes they've come in very timely like, oh, I got to bar off, like, I'm cool, like, I need to unplug. But one of the things I say, the villages have helped me to be a signing board and also give me different perspectives that I didn't think about. And one time I remember a, a colleague, um, uh, very dear to me, he said, maybe you need to step away and let them feel the impact of you not being there. Um, because uh, you are conscious of that department, and they, are, they used you as a crutch. So step away. And it hurt because I was so passionate about the work and what I was doing. And I stepped away. I did my little nice transition for us. And here's everything right here. And I stepped away. Um, and then I started to kind of be steady with my intention. Like I'm involved, but I, I don't need to lead it, right? Because people can become very comfortable with you leading from the front. And I had a colleague, I actually had a white colleague approach me one time and say, you must get a lot of people that want you to come talk to their class or talk to their staff about DEI stuff. I don't want to do that. I don't want to overtax you. And I think it, it came because I have been practicing. I'm going to show up when I'm able to show up. And I'm not just going to keep showing up and y'all taking me for granted. Because I did. I, I felt like I was taken for granted. I felt like I wasn't taken seriously. I felt like we were maintaining status quo. Everything you just shared is real, sister. And I had to step away from my other things. But I also started to align myself because what they what the foundation of it, I think Elori, is that how you pronounce your name? Elori? Ellery. Ellery. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what I saw was, hey, what they was what I was trying to get out of the work was not what they were trying to do. And so I went to the table and said, what are y'all looking for me to do at this mm -hmm. position? And they said, oh well we only need this and this. And I was doing eight eight through ten, right? Yeah. <laughs> they were like I mean, that's cool and we appreciate you, but so I said, oh, so you don't need me to, okay, so I dialed back some, but then I also ended up stepping away from it because I still felt like I was turning granted. And it just came down to reality, what the department wanted and what I wanted, social justice-wise, how we define the, our commitment were to, 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 totally different pages. So I said, you know what? It did spur me to start searching. I'm not telling you to search, but yeah. it did spur me to start searching because of um, and then I started to figure out also, I connected with my people in other departments and in my villages to fill my cup, okay. right? Because that the other foundational truth was I wasn't getting filled by what I was doing that usually fills me, right? Because yeah. the people, I felt like the people were taking me for granted. I felt like the people didn't care. They just said, well, we did a program in February, so we're good. Like, yeah. what? No. Yeah. 
no, nah, you got to come again. So uh, I'm I'm happy to more to connect and, and, and serve in that village because they can be very very taxing. And I think and, and what's even more taxing is they will never you know some people would never understand. They yeah. will never want to understand how taxing it is, right? Um, but I will say, kind of a ploy on my presentation is continue to drop those seeds, Ellie. Okay. Continue to drop those seeds. There are things that people have contacted me from a school I worked at 10 years ago that says, we remember when you were here and you did this and we're still doing this. And I'm like, well, y'all ain't appreciate it when I was there. <laughs> but okay, y'all got the message. It's cool. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, I just had to continue to do those things. But I did it from a self-care, a me first perspective. I had to dial back. Again, once I found out what they were actually looking for and I was doing a lot, I was doing way more than that. Um, and then also find other platforms that your work can be appreciated. I'm going to yeah. tell you, and I'm not advocating for this, but I'm going to just drop this. There was one time I, 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 uh, I had a proposal at an institution. I wanted to do an initiative at my institution. They were not for it. I said, okay. I found a, uh, ACP or ADASPA. I went and presented it, and people would yeah. contact me. And then they contacted my director. was like, this is a wonderful initiative. Like, yeah. they, you know, can we team up and do it together? Like, I'd like to know what y'all are doing there. And then they came saying, hey, so I've given you a proposal or another. Pro I know you did. I know you did. Yeah. But I'm no longer interested or available. So you need to figure out how you're going to do this. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that way, because I felt like some of my energy and work was going to waste. But when I redirected it and put it in some other cups, then I was like, okay, I'm getting my, I'm getting my fulfillment. Right? Yeah. I appreciate you saying that because I just presented at NASPA, Alabama, oh. and it was like, okay, I'm not, I'm not crazy. I know what I'm doing a little yeah. bit, okay, yeah. and um, not, to, not to toot my horn, but I, my presentation won for best presentation, so I was like, and then people started <laughs> contacting me to present, and I was like, okay, like it, it did, it like it filled my cup and made me feel. More go. confident about what was going on, so I appreciate yeah. you saying that. So. That's amazing. Keep doing. But thank you. Thank yeah, you. keep doing that work. And I've I've tried to. There's one presentation I did it like seven different times. Yeah. Same presentation. It was just different spaces because I felt like that's what people need. And now I go back. I look at the feedback. Mm -hmm. I try to tweak and twerk. And I say twerk. Lord, Lord have mercy. It's lunch time. I tried to tweak the presentation uh, to, to Kate, like, okay, they made a good point. I need to change that. I need to change my flow a little bit. And I just kept trying to, like, really perfect the craft. So, right. um, but yeah, it was really, it's it's, it's really, because it's, it's personal to you, right? It's not yeah. personal to everybody. So that also helped maintain my self-care. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for this presentation. It's um, my first like professional job post grad school, mm -hmm. and I've been feeling a lot of the things, dealing with a lot of the things, um, especially with the year that we just had. Um, and so this just like really, not only like gave voice to a lot of the things that we're dealing with, but also giving actual solutions and like steps that we can take to, to improve upon things and things that I can talk with my supervisor about and my staff about to just move forward. So I just really appreciate not only highlighting the issues, but like giving us some action oriented solutions. So I appreciated that. You're welcome. It takes time, you know, and I'm, I, it's, I don't own a lot of this. Um, I just spend a lot of time trying to be intentional uh, and learn a lot from, from making, making some faults and being exhausted. Um, but I also have some documents that folks want to share, like when I talked about the three R system for recruitment recognition, I wrote a complete tier program about how to do it. Um, so if you need anything, or if I don't have it, I'm more than willing to be a think tank together so we can figure this out. Because I, I I don't care about credit. I just want us to get better, right? Like I've been in, you know, been in this 12 going on 13 years, and it don't it doesn't feel good for me to look at some practices that the, the profession is doing. It's like, oh, I saw that when I was a hall director. Like, what? It was problematic then, and it's problematic now. So I so I try to use my leadership. I try to surround myself with community. I have a great support network on here. Uh, I see my supervisor, Megan, uh, it, that that allows me to come to work as my full self. So, uh, but, you know, and that hasn't always been the case. Right. Um, but definitely 
any practices. Like I'd be pulling from people. If I see something, like I try to go to as many presentation follow up with people, whether we connect on here via group me, email, whatever the case may be, like, hey, we doing this great thing. Like I need to know so we can kind of you know perfect what we're doing, right? We improve. I guess I get away from perfection. Yeah. We want to improve, we want to, to make this better uh, going forward. And we have to do it together. Like a lot of the things I do now and a lot of things you all saw today was from countless dialogues and conversations and failures and attempts. And some of us just being brave. We're like, well, they're either going to like it or they're not. So I'm here. Um, I'll definitely be emailing you to reach out. Like the okay. slide is locked and exhausted. I was like, I'm, I'm not even a full year into this. And I am both of those things very much so. So um, I got a whole other presentation around that and I can get it to you. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, good people. I think I, I don't know if I shared my address, but. Yep, yeah, you you had it up there, so I know okay. folks are able to get that. So I also realized that you, since you're the host, you have the power to end this meeting. Oh, I'm I, I'm I have the power. But, so just protecting your time here and everybody else's, whenever you are ready, you can go ahead and end it. Sure, sure, okay. Well, if, if, if uh, thank you for everybody that has remained and that attended today. I really do appreciate it. And, I just ask us to employ us to continue to grow in community. I think, you know, those familiar faces, those new faces, those faces that I know uh, by name and just really appreciate you all's present to, presence today. Um, this has also en energized me to continue going forward, right? To continue to challenge and inventory myself. Uh, I just started a new job at VCU, so uh, prayers and grace with that. But they've, they've been phenomenal uh, with getting me up, up to speed and, and and just welcome me into community, which can make a, a whole lot of a difference. So, uh, see Jayla, see Savon, thank you all so much for being on. Appreciate y'all. Hi. <laughs> uh, okay. Hey, my good thank folks. Down there. Hey. Uh, okay. <laughs> all right. Well, I am going to end this again. If you have questions, feel free to contact me. Um, and I'm I'm more than willing to follow up either with a Zoom, not to Zoom folks out, but. Uh, or follow up by email or, or just to check in on each other. Let's just make sure, you know, that we stay in community. Y'all stay safe out there um, and take care of yourself.